All right, this is uh, dealing with divorce, difficult issues, biblical answers. This is lesson two in that series. What to do in case of divorce, and I'm going to kind of break this up into two parts. Break it up into two parts. Uh, I look around and uh, just in our classroom and I, and I also go by the knowledge that I have of our congregation and I think that it would be a fair guess to say that most people in the room have been affected by divorce in some way or another. Either it's happened to them or it has happened to someone in their family, a close friend, or it may be in the process of happening, but somewhere, somehow, everybody can relate to a, uh, a divorce. Um, we can have a long discussion about the evils of divorce or the biblical doctrine of you know, marriage, divorce and remarriage or how to avoid divorce. And I'll talk about that in subsequent lessons as we go on. But we rarely talk about what we should do when divorce actually happens. I've never heard a class, I've never been to a class uh, in the church anyways, where somebody talks about, okay, the divorce is actually happening. What do you do? You know, if you're the one going through it or if you're the one observing it, what do you do? So it's important to know what to do because no matter what we think about divorce, it does happen. You know, it's like I want to tell people, come on, get into Realityville. Divorce happens all the time. So it does happen. And uh, so I want to uh, give us uh, today some of the do's and don'ts to guide us in the event of divorce. So if divorce is happening, you're a spectator or you're in, you know, you're in it, Here's some things to do and some things not to do. So I'm going to talk about the do's and don'ts when divorce happens to someone else. And then in the second part, next time, next week, I'll go over some of the do's and don'ts when it's actually happening to you. Okay, so today we're going to do do's and don'ts if it's happening to somebody else. Next time, do's and don'ts if it's happening to you. So let's begin the first one. The don'ts, things not to do. Number one, don't take sides. Divorce not only divorces couples and divides couples, it also divides families, friends, even churches. The division happens because people want to believe that someone is right and someone is wrong in the divorce. Division also happens because the individuals in the couple want and need support during this crisis. So what do they do? Well, they gather around them those people who will be sympathetic to their cause. Now the problem with supporting one person is that it usually comes at the expense of rejecting the other person. You know, people going through divorce, you know, they want their supporters to be exclusive and loyal to them. No help or sympathy for the enemies, like a war. It gets to be like a war. Of course, this is normal for close family and relatives who tend to you know, circle the wagons when divorce happens. You know, if it's your son getting the divorce, well, obviously you, you want to protect him and you know, she's, she's wrong and vice versa. It's just human nature. Now the problem grows when one side begins to recruit it's one thing to get natural sympathy you know, from the close, but when one side starts to recruit, then we have problems. In other words, we try to round up as many people as we can to support our cause, to support our rightness. Pretty soon, everybody surrounding the couple finds themselves having to choose one side or another because neutrality is not an option in a divorce. You're with us or you're against us. That's what seems to happen. In the end, this becomes a contest to see who can win the sympathy vote. Of course, all of this doesn't really help the couple. That's the point. It's not helpful. And it does not prevent a divorce. Never one time have I seen this ever prevent the divorce. Not once, and I've seen a lot of divorces. All it does is assign the blame through majority. You know, the one with the greater number of sympathizers wins the blame game. One is guilty, one is innocent, based on the size of your group. 
So the net result, however, is that many friendships and relationships become strained or broken instead of just the couple who are getting the divorce. Bad enough, the couple are getting the divorce and the children are being affected. It, the repercussions then go beyond that circle where it doesn't have to. Number two, so don't pick sides. Number two, don't think you know why. <laughs> what's interesting and what's interestingly sad about divorce is that everybody thinks they know why it happened. Everybody's got a theory. For example, oh, she couldn't have children, or he was always unfaithful, or she was a nag or cold, or he was selfish and immature, or her mother interfered, or he liked his buddies better, or you know, it goes on and on. The truth of the matter is that no one outside the marriage really knows. And many times, even the partners within the relationship don't even know why their marriage is breaking up. <laughs> That's the surprising thing. Even they themselves haven't kind of gotten in touch with the real reason the thing is going south. In many instances, they only know why, they only know rather that they're unhappy or unfulfilled, but they cannot articulate the reasons without the help of a third party. That's what counseling is for. We like to think that we know because it helps make sense of a bad thing or it provides us with a reason to assign blame or to take sides. If I know what's happening in that person's marriage, well then I can you know, feel comfortable about blaming him or blaming her. Now I'm not saying that you can't know the reasons for the failure of a marriage. You can with time. But the reasons are usually much more complex and hidden than we think they are. It's not just you know, on the surface. A significant thing that I've learned in my years of dealing with people going through divorce is this. Except in extreme cases where one partner is mentally unstable in some serious way, an abuser, sociopath, you know, some real mental issue, both partners contribute significantly to their eventual divorce. That's what I've learned through experience. It takes two to tango. It's not always 50-50, you know, rarely. 60-40, 70-30, you know, sometimes 99 and one, but usually there's a contribution from both parties that eventually sink the marriage. And because we tend to avoid acknowledging our own guilt to ourselves and others, it's very difficult to discern what each has done to undermine the success of their marriage. Most people I know who've gone through a divorce only realize the true why much later after they have matured and reflected and acknowledge their own failings in regards to their marriage. How many divorced people I know that 10 years after the divorce they say, well, you know, <laughs> If I knew then what I know now, I might have been able to do some different things. Or if I knew myself better, you know, and so on and so forth. And this sometimes it just takes years, if ever, to take place. So don't be, remember this is for people watching the divorce you know, from the outside. Don't be too quick to decide and proclaim that you know why, because you really don't know. And you're not helping when you say that you do, and you're really not helping when you're kind of sharing your wisdom about this person's marriage here with everybody you come in contact. You're not helping the situation. You know, less is more in this kind of thing. Keeping your, you know, your mouth shut here, this is, this is a better thing. You know, I, I would encourage everybody to resist the impulse of giving your opinion as to why so-and-so's marriage is falling apart. So don't choose sides. Don't say that you know why. Number three, don't feel superior. <laughs> One reason why divorced people don't want to hear the gospel if they're not Christians or why they leave the church if they are Christians is because they feel inferior among us. It's as if a divorce was a sin greater and more heinous than other sins. Somehow divorce becomes the unforgivable sin. 
People have said to me that a divorce seems to relegate them to a position of second class citizen in the church. Yeah, they're Christians, yes, but merely tolerated and not embraced as equals. Of course, for this to happen, there must exist this you know, invisible sense of superiority by others who by the grace of God have avoided this particular sin. I mean, it's normal, I suppose, to feel superior when you've succeeded at something that someone sitting right next to you has failed at. But the problem here is that we are comparing ourselves to each other instead of comparing ourselves to Christ. As Christians, I, I don't compare myself to my brother or my sister. I have no right to do that. I compare myself to Christ. And when we do this, you know, in other words, when we compare ourselves to each other, we risk feeling superior or inferior. Uh, there's no middle ground here. But when we compare ourselves to Christ, we can only feel grateful, gratitude. This is because despite our obvious sinfulness in comparison to the Lord, we see in His cross the mercy and grace that He offers, and this brings feelings of relief and joy and peace, not feelings of superiority or inferiority. What makes you think you're so much better than someone else who's failed at marriage? Have you gone through what they went through? <laughs> you know, the reason that Jesus went to the cross is he went to the cross in order to find forgiveness for the one who failed at marriage and the one who failed at telling the truth and the one who failed at being sexually pure and the one who failed at this and that and the other. That gives us the right perspective of ourselves when we compare ourselves to Christ instead of comparing ourselves to each other. So when, when you see a divorced person, don't feel superior because it may be that their righteousness may be greater than yours in other areas of life and service. I mean, who made divorce the be all and end all you know, measurement to you know, the, how we measure the quality of someone's faith? It's one sin among many. So remember that in God's eyes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. So to feel superior is a sign of pride and a tool of the devil to separate the church and discourage the faith of those who have failed and sinned in marriage. Now I could mention other don'ts if I had the time to develop these ideas. For example, don't gossip about the situation because this only spreads the division to more people. Gossip feels good. You know, people say, why, why do people gossip? Well, because it feels good. <laughs> It feels good to gossip. We like to gossip because, wow, when we have a juicy morsel, boy, we just can't wait to find somebody to share it with. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, gossip does irreparable damage. And don't judge the people involved. There will be a judgment, but God will do it. And if He does it, it'll be accurate, it'll be fair. He hasn't given, we don't judge because He hasn't given this to us to do. It's not our job. And don't play marriage counselor. Just because you drive a car doesn't mean you're a mechanic and you can diagnose and repair your car properly. Well, just because you're married or you've been through a divorce doesn't qualify you to be a marriage counselor telling people how to live their lives and fix their marriage problems. Who made you the counselor? What school did you go to? I mean, you can offer an opinion. You can share your own experience. This is good. But people are extremely vulnerable when going through a divorce and they need help. So be careful not to try to become you know, an authority on marriage because you've been married 20 years or an expert on divorce because you've had a divorce. Because you know what? You're not qualified. Dealing with people in crisis requires special training and knowledge because you can make things a lot worse if you're not careful. You know, even in my life, even in my work, in my ministry where I've dealt with countless couples going through a divorce, I always try to refer them to marriage counselors or therapists for clinical counseling 
since I'm not formally trained in these areas. I mean, a lot of ministers have been sued by individuals because they took on the role of, quote, counselor, professional counselor, and did harm. They did damage to the individual. So even as ministers, you know, when you go to school and you, you're in training, the professors tell you in this area to be very careful. There's a line there for you know, pastoral, pastoral counseling is one thing, but you know, clinical counseling, that's a whole other thing. So I realize that as a minister, you know, I have a role to play in providing pastoral, spiritual guidance, encouragement in time of need, but I let the people trained in marriage crisis to do their work. Why? Because I want my brethren to receive the very best help that is out there. And when it comes to, quote, serious long-term marriage counseling, I am not the best option out there. There are people that just do this for a living. They've been trained to do it. So a lot of times the best thing I or you can do is convince people to get professional help when their marriage is in trouble. You know, what's, what's amazing to me is if, you're, if, you're, if the transmission in your car starts to rattle a bit, you'll take it to whatever transmission special, specialist and they'll charge you, you know, well, it'll be $2,400 and you go, oh, dear, $2,400, all right. You, know, you give them the credit card, you put the 2,400 bucks and you get your transmission fixed or your gutters are leaking and you'll get those fixed. Or you, you have a sore leg or something, you, know, you can't play tennis because you've got, to, you know, I don't know, a torn meniscus. You'll spend money and all kinds of you know, time to rehab your knee so you can you know, run again. But people won't spend five minutes or five dollars going to see a counselor to save their marriage. I tell young people who are thinking of getting married, you know, they're, they're, th they're getting engaged and thinking of getting married, and they'll spend $25,000, $3,000 just on a dress that they'll wear one time, period, and never wear again. But they balk at the idea of spending $500 on you know, a series of, uh, of professional premarital counseling uh, sessions. <laughs> it makes no sense. And then three years down the road when the marriage hits the rocks or the marriage has trouble, they wonder, you know, why, what's the problem? Well, you didn't get the help that was, that was there. Okay, so enough for what not to do. You know, we can go all day with what not to do, but I think those are the, the big ones. Let's look at the positive side of the picture, the do's, what to do in case of divorce. You know, we're not completely helpless when these things happen. There are some things that we can and that we should do. All right, number one, do pray. Pretty obvious, right? Let's face it, we don't know what's really going on. We shouldn't pick sides and may not be qualified to give advice. That's true. But the powerful avenue of prayer, that is open to us. I don't ask the marriage counselor to pray for me. I ask for my minister to pray for me. I ask for my elders to pray for me. You know, everybody has their responsibilities. I believe that many marriages fail because there's not enough prayer invested in them by the couple or those around them. You, know, you talk to your girlfriends at work and about the problem, blah, 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 and, you know, or the guy talks to his buddies about the problem and their advice will be, well, dump her. You know, get rid of that thing. Just walk away. Hopefully your Christian friends will say, well, I'm not sure what to say to you, but Let's, let's at least pray about this together. That's a good thing. Let's start there. You know, if we spent less time gossiping about the situation, more time in prayer about it, it would create a much more positive impact. And you know, I tell people, if you're not sure, just weigh the amount of time, you know, measure the amount of time spent talking about the problem to other people, which has zero positive effect, and how much time you spend in prayer to God about it, who actually has the power to change things. You know, measure those things. Jesus promises that prayer will yield results. Doesn't he say, ask, you will receive, Matthew 7, 7. We should take him at his word. Constant and fervent prayer by the people around the couple 
and the couple themselves would do more to save the marriage than taking sides or gossiping or assigning blame. So do pray. Do listen. Really listen. You know, the time to avoid the divorce is before the breakup, not once the lawyers are involved. By this time we're you know, playing catch up and people have usually pretty much made up their minds. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think now. I, I'm, I'm thinking back. If, if there has been a couple, in my experience anyways, that's all anecdotal, but if in my experience, if there's been one couple that who decided to divorce and then you know, got some counseling or I, I was you know, involved in trying to help them and they put off their divorce and actually went on and succeeded. And I, I can't think of a couple, nothing comes to mind. I mean, I want to be discouraging about that. What I'm saying is a lot of times by the time that people come to see me, they've already made up their minds. They're on the way out the door. Pretty tough. Some go to counseling after they've begun divorce proceedings, but usually it's to calm their guilt concerning what they've done or are about to do. They, they want to be able to say, I tried everything. Some people have tried everything and it's still not working. I, I get that, of course. So divorce can be headed off if we pay attention to what unhappy couples are saying to us long before the breakup. This is the point I'm making here, just in case I, you know, I slid off the, you know, the line. For example, uh, you know, I'm saying to you, have a sensitive ear for these things, for your family and friends. For example, continual complaints or putting down of the other spouse to you. That tells you something's not right here. Or expressions of sorrow or unhappiness or depression. Or decrease in noticeable affection and joy and wanting to be together by that couple. If you're, if you're close to them, family, best friends, whatever, and you notice there's no more hand holding, no more kissing, no more nice smiles, no more compliments. You know, it's just pay attention or jokes about lack of sex or lack of fun or lack of intimacy or financial problems or, or decreased spiritual commitment by one or both of the partners. All of a sudden, she's coming to church alone. Now it happens, of course, obviously, one partner comes, the other comes, there are things that happen in life, but all of a sudden, she's just showing up at church with the two kids or the three kids and you know, he's never there. Should we wait six months of this before we actually go up to the person and say, hey, I haven't seen Joe around. You know, where's Joe? If you're paying attention, you will notice these type of things. And if you can hear them, then do something about it. Sometimes just asking if everything is OK can begin a series of conversations at a time when something can actually be done to help before it's too late. You know, Jesus said, Whatever God has joined together, let not man separate. We know that passage, Matthew 19, 6. But we seem to think that God says that it's impossible to fail in marriage because He has blessed it and He's made it special. But that's not what He's saying. God is saying we should not separate. It is wrong if we separate. It's against His will if we separate. Not that it's impossible to do. It's against his will that we steal, but it's not impossible that we steal. You see what I'm saying here? If we listen to what people say, maybe we can help them avoid this all too common sin. Sometimes listening is the greatest service that we can provide. But unfortunately, and men are more like this than women, men want to fix things. So the person just wants to talk. They just want to get it out. They just want to vent. They just want to lay out their issue and share the burden. And a lot of times what we do is we're, as they're talking, the wheel is turning and we're trying to come up with a solution. Well, there is no solution right now. They just want you to listen. And listening often leads to praying which is always the first step in healing any relationship. Absolute devotion to prayer. Finally, the best thing that you can do in case of divorce, love both 
partners. Love them both. You know, when I do a pastoral counseling with a couple, my personal objective is to love both people in that marriage. This isn't always easy because sometimes one partner may be much harder to love than the other one. For example, the husband cheats on his wife with a younger woman, dumps her with two teenagers to raise by herself, and he's off with his new 20 year younger than him girlfriend. Well, that old boy, you know, I want to take him out in the back of the woodshed and you know, womp on him for a while. Right? <laughs> I'd like to do that. But this would neither solve or change the problem. In this situation you know, that I've just described, all too familiar, she needs love to be able to deal with the hurt that she feels and the difficult situation that she's in. She's in a pickle. He provides the support. She's stayed home. She's raised the kids and so on and so forth. And now he's taken off. Where's she at? She's still got to raise these kids. And then he, he needs love because this will be the only way to keep the line of communication open with him. She's in danger of being depressed and having a hard time and discouraged and you know, perhaps a lower standard of living and a whole life change. She's in you know, danger of that. He's in danger of losing his soul. So loving her doesn't mean you believe she's absolutely innocent or right in everything. It means that you're meeting her need for comfort and encouragement at a difficult moment in her life. And loving him does not justify. It does not excuse what he has done. It means you still care for him as a person and you have not abandoned him. Now, if these two ever got back together again, and sometimes they do, they'll remember who loved them when they needed it most. And if they don't, then your love will help heal the wounds caused by their failed relationship and subsequent divorce. She'll know that when she needed it most, your love for her was there. And he'll know that even when he didn't deserve it, your love was there for him too. Who knows? Maybe it will be your love that will give him the courage to admit his sin and be restored to God, even if his wife won't take him back. Because a lot of times these, the, the quote guilty party, the very guilty party, they don't repent and come back because they think that God has the same attitude that their wives have. Well, that sorry sucker, I'm not taking him back, but I got rid of, you know, I moved on with my life. God doesn't have that attitude. God takes us back. So love, you know, it won't guarantee that you'll save the marriage, but it may help save a soul. And it may help save self-esteem. And it may save each from further damaging their family. And it may save the relationship beyond the couple, like the children of the couple and the parents and the friends and the brethren and the co-workers. Because people are watching, you know, how are people reacting? And if they see the way you react, you love both partners without justifying, maybe they'll copy that attitude. You, know, you may not be able to force the partners going through a divorce to love each other, but you can make sure that you love them because you know that no matter what is happening, God still loves them. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting quote, a preacher and teacher, his name is uh, Jerry Jones. And uh, he does a marriage seminar uh, along with his wife where the publicity materials and the posters and the pamphlets have this saying here, all marriages end in either death or divorce. <laughs> We're thinking that, that's pretty depressing, but it's true, isn't it? All married till death do us part. If you stay faithful, how's your marriage end? Well, you die. Or there's a divorce. There isn't another option there. Now, they, these two, this couple, Jerry and his wife, and I'm sorry, I forget her name at the moment, but Jerry is a widower. So he knows about his wife had cancer and for years he took care of her and so on. And his second wife now, she's a divorcee. 
So she understands what it's like to go through divorce. So together, you know, they've married, they've had a happy and, and, and very uh, productive marriage uh, for many years now. And uh, after a couple of years of marriage, they went into this seminar thing. I mean, they, they're able to speak about marriage from both, you know, both, per, both perspectives. Um, so um, this is true uh, when you think about it, even if it's not a happy thought. So my lesson today, I wanted to emphasize the, emphasize the fact that sooner or later, most of you here will be affected by, confronted with, or victims of divorce in some way. I mean, it's not right, it's not the ideal, it's not what God wants for us, but many times it is what it is. And when it happens, remember, don't pick sides, don't think you know why, don't feel smug, don't gossip, don't judge, don't play counselor, all of these things are counterproductive. If you want to help, really help, pray fervently, listen attentively, love graciously. And doing these things may heal the marriage and will certainly lessen the evil destruction and pain suffered by everyone, because it's all about pain. Divorce is all about pain. A lot of people think, well, the divorce is the solution. No, 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 no. The divorce is just, it's pain. Even if it's righteous, even if in the sense, you know, uh, uh, somebody has left you and so on and so forth, and you just have to file the papers. I've seen people who have been abandoned in a marriage. They're all alone. They've been abandoned. Their partner has gone like a year, two years, nothing. They've gone on with their lives. They've got a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whatever. And just filing the paperwork you know, to bury the body, so to speak, is extremely painful. So you know, we're, we're, dealing, we're dealing with something that's painful for people who go through it and for people who have to watch people they love go through it as well. Okay. All right. Not a very happy class, uh, but I think uh, information that's needful. We're going to go on. We're going to talk about you know, what do you do when you remarry? Uh, and, and we'll talk about all those passages that talk about you know, can you remarry? Should you? Is it a sin? All that kind of stuff. But that'll be a little further down in our lesson uh, series. So thank you for your attention.